thanks for having me. Um, as Daniel said, I'm here to talk about void fraud. Um, we put out a publication uh, last last month. Um, I've got plenty of copies here. You're, you're welcome to take some away. Um, but I'm, I'm going to run through the key the key messages in there uh, today. Um, firstly, a little bit about who we are and, and what we do. Uh, we're a, a UK-based network operator. Um, we do wholesale voice. We only do wholesale voice. So that principally consists of, of, of UK numbering. Uh, we have a full national footprint, global termination in, in varying uh, qualities. And increasingly, um, given our architecture, we're hosting numbering for traditional telcos that want the benefits of great APIs and low cost, but no longer want to operate SS7 architecture, or indeed up and coming telcos that are at a stage where they'd otherwise implement that, but don't want to. Uh, they're hosted on us using all of the, all of the cool tools we, we put out there. We've got a national UK network um, built by necessity rather than legacy. 90% of the traffic we, uh, we carry is RTP. And it's only there because back in the day we needed to improve the elements of the supply chain that we, we couldn't control. A bit about us on our website, a bit about what we think on, on the blog. You can also join our, our newsletter there if you're interested. So, toll fraud um, and dial through fraud. Estimates put the cost at around 46 billion a year. Um, I would say that is an underestimate. Um, because the reality is the cost is, is practically unlimited. And if a system is penetrated, these guys will go for as long as they can and they will take as much money as they possibly can. The only thing stopping them is somebody finding out. And that can happen at different rates in different, different organisations. <coughs> so that figure is, is really a, an illustration of how bad the good guys are rather than how good the, and the intent of the, of the bad guys. Why does the problem exist? We, we don't tend to talk about commercial stuff much in the, in, in the SIP world. But if we cast our, our sort of minds into traditional telephony, if you've got two network operators, let's take us and BT as an example, if they pass a call to us because they want to reach one of the numbers, the traditional PSTN numbers behind our network, they will, they will pay us a chunk for doing so. We'll bill them. They will sell that onto their customers and they'll add a bit of margin, and so it will go on until it's in the hands of a, a consumer um, and a, a call charge, with everybody having had their, their piece of the piece of the plan. Different de destinations have different numbers of people in the chain. Different network operators have different base level base <coughs> level costs, which is why you see such variety amongst call charges for the for the planet. It's really easy to screw up. There's no there's no one authoritative legally reliable source of what codes matter to what destination, what the commercials on those, on those should be. So if somebody screws up, not only do they make a loss themselves, but that loss potentially, or rather the, the price adjustment for that loss, propagates down through the, through the market. And there's people out there that will capitalise on this and uh, use least cost routing and, and send predatory traffic, but it creates a, creates a bigger issue than that. Some of those number ranges are used for premium rate services where in addition to the operator's chunk, you've got a kind of service charge element. And we all know them in, in our own respective countries. And that has, two, that has two effects. One, the stakes are much higher because the base level cost is, cost is much higher, but otherwise it's, it, it's fundamentally the same. But if somebody makes a loss, not only is there a loss to the, to the operator that makes the mistake, but there's also potential for a profit for somebody. So if they can buy calls at that rate, but they're getting that rate as an ag payment, every call they pass through, they're making a profit. <coughs> and you tend to find where this exists, there's, a, there's an infinite loop created very, very quickly. If they can do that at no cost, then obviously that infinite, infinite loop accelerates much, much quicker, and where, where they penetrate the system, they do so. Why does this matter? Well, everything we've heard about today is, is, is talking about how voice revenues are going are to vanish. They're certainly diminishing, both at the hands of regulators and at the hands of, at the hands of technology empowering consumers. So build revenue is going down. Operators are also bundling minutes in with other stuff, so they'll give you TV and voice and internet access all for one, 
or for one monthly fee. But the costs of fraud are going up. More and more people are implementing you know, VoIP. More and more user endpoints are, are therefore accessible and, and vulnerable to penetration. So the whole thing is, is, is changing in, in, in a way that we don't really want and doesn't, doesn't uh, benefit us in any way. We think the wholesale market needs to wake up to that and, and adjust itself. And rather than micromanaging uh, least cost routes, we think the wholesale market needs to focus on risk. Because the reality is one compromised end user can wipe out all of the margin gain you're going to get fanning about changing routes um, throughout the year. Back in 2011, we uh, set up a darknet. Um, now, the darknet was a, a slash 24, so a block of 255 um, IPv4 addresses. But we just made publicly accessible and linked them to our uh, intrusion detection systems and just logged what the traffic on there was. These IP addresses had never been in use. Um, they were, you know, they were newly, newly issued. There was no services behind them. It was just dark, hence the name, dark, dark address space. And the traffic that we saw on that was representative of, of the noise that you see out there on the internet. So any machine you stick online, will see, will see traffic. Usually, conflict with worms and things, trying to find new hosts to, to in, infect. One interesting thing that we noticed was that about one percent of the traffic on there was sick. I think that's a, it's a little bit odd. So we, we deigned to investigate a little bit further and we set up a honeypot. Now the honeypot is just a bog standard off the shelf uh, free switch installation. We had to quite quickly rein in some of the enum stuff and, and make that non-standard. But it's, it's basically there with default passwords, sitting online, you know, begging to be, to be hacked. Except we capture everything that goes on there um, and we analyse it and we have done for the three years um, since it was first put up there. The findings from that are and always have been uh, available online um, at that URL, which is CSV files, updated everything from real time, showing the last 60 minutes on the honeypot, right through to showing the, the previous year. And it shows everything from user agents used, IP addresses, um, you, know, you can build whatever you want on, on that data. wouldn't recommend implementing the, uh, the IP addresses as a, as a straight blacklist without uh, filtering because we don't do any kind of sanity checking or filtering on it, it's just as is, but it's, but it's there and we'll come on some of the uses of that in a, in a little bit. So what do we know from, from that? Well the first stage is what we call reconnaissance <coughs> and in a SIP scan, which is a typical um, method of, of, of penetration, it all begins with an options request. You put anything online and you will see just a lone options request, unconnected to, to anything else, and you may see nothing, nothing more. Now, you can see the trend is up and to the right quite severely, but the numbers are still quite low. So on the honeypot, we saw under 1,800 options requests in 2013. That's kind of three or four a day. You wouldn't notice those on a production network, particularly a production network where you've got genuine users sending genuine genuine options requests. But if they get a positive response to that options request, they don't move on immediately to the next stage. You go in kind of, kind of queue. Sorry, let me come back to that stage. Where we see this, uh, where we see this coming from um, is slightly sensitive, given where we are. Um, I would say that is down to the very well-developed and uh, competitive um, hosting market that you guys have over here. Um, we see these options and the next stage in, in particular coming from uh, dedicated server networks. They're not coming from the access networks. They're not coming from script kiddies sitting at home. They're coming from, uh, you know, like I say, hosting networks, cloud providers and the like. The second stage I mentioned, um, where somebody's responded positively to an options request, usually within about 24 hours and usually from a different IP address but typically one that's fairly close to the one that the options request came from, so usually within the same slash 29 or something, again pointing to a small installation at a, at a hosting uh, provider, is, is the scam. Now this is a flood of registration attempts. If you run um, asterisk or similar with um, a relational database behind the scenes, you'll probably have seen these and thought they were a denial of service attack. 
because they come stupidly quickly. Um, and if you're looking up username and password credentials in, in, a, in a database, they're, they're going to cause you a problem. They will keep going until they get one that works, um, is, is the simple fact of the matter. Um, and they'll send millions and millions of them um, until they do. The trend there, again, is up and to the right, but at a much higher level. As a real caveat on, this, uh, on, on this, these numbers, once we've got a reasonable number of data points for a given attack, there's no value in us letting it continue. It just fills up logs. And actually, the product we use for analysis uh, tends to stop working when those logs get too big in a certain, in a certain period. Um, so we tend to cut them off. So don't take those figures as absolute. They would be massively, massively higher if we let these things uh, let these things go on. Again, where they come from? Um, you guys are doing well. Again, that's a good deal. Dedicated server server market. But don't worry, it's better. The options request may also reveal um, that that uh, a service provider or an end user is running a, a particular piece of equipment. Um, we had an instance over the Christmas period where one of our customers had a big brand PBX out on all of their all of their customer sites, and somebody had done a lot of recon in the period before Christmas um, and established that this big brand PBX that in the days preceding VoIP um, had a tappy interface. Um, but now they've retrofitted uh, VoIP capability to it, and the service provider hadn't implemented uh, ACLs appropriately, that TAPI interface was publicly available. So they could target those PBXs one by one on, se on sequential nights, uh, manipulate channels with, with the TAPI interface, and pass traffic to their, to their heart's content. The typical targeted exploit we see, however, is at the HTTP or the admin layer interface, so a compromised MySQL instance, for example, or these PBX in a box type products where they'll take a great open source product and then layer on a whole load of security <coughs> holes on top. Um, they're particularly nasty. The other one is auto-provisioning. Um, now, I'm sure many of, you, many of you use this. You ship a headless phone out, somebody plugs it in, it makes a call home to the manufacturer. Now, that call home is typically a HTTP request with a few other bits with the MAC address suffixed. You can find out the URL for those by cutting the firmware that's there for, for anybody to see and they're also, they're also online. That uh, manufacturer server will issue a redirect so the phone will then contact the next layer down and eventually it will contact the, the auto-provisioning server at the ITSP. Again with the MAC address suffixed. Now you might think MAC address, well they're globally unique that's really good. Except when you think that actually they're allocated in blocks to manufacturers. So if you know the manufacturer of the phone, you automatically narrow what you're looking at. And then certain manufacturers segment them further. So SNOM, for example, take a particular block of their particular MAC address block for each model of phone. So if somebody knows what model an ITSP is shipping, then they can very easily take advantage of this. Some manufacturers are really good, uh, it's, it's by standard over HTTPS. Others offer a client certificate based on, on the MAC address again over HTTPS, but it isn't turned on by default. So, very much like Olo was saying, you know, typically out there in the wild, this is over plain text, HTTP, with no enforcement of encryption. So you can, somebody can harvest configurations, which I remind you include the username and password and SIP endpoint for a SIP provider very, very easily. When they have got a compromised endpoint, they'll go on and send, and send, uh, send traffic. Now, a few years ago, um, we would have said that that traffic was um, targeted to expensive destinations, given what I said. You know, these guys want to call Somalia. They want to get an ag payment on the, you know, on, on, on the call there. But in recent years, as you can see, although the trend has been um, up and to the right, and again <coughs> cut off because we, we, we don't let these things run, the, the traffic has uh, differed, changed quite a bit. It's not coming from you guys, uh, thankfully. It's coming from, it's fair to say, the usual destinations you associate with any kind of online, online crime, um, notably the USA. What's different about it 
is they're not calling Somalia anymore. They're not calling Lithuania. They're calling bog-standard geographic numbers. They're sending what we call and we believe to be test traffic. Because the thing you need to understand is the honeypot, whilst it's a bog-standard free switch, what it also does is answer the call. So in the old days, when they were passing calls through, they thought they were being successful. We were sending them an answer, the media was exchanged, happy days. They realised that actually the checks weren't arriving when they were, when they were doing this. So they're now testing implementations um, when, they've gained, when they've gained access by dialing numbers that presumably they control the, the other end of. So they're passing calls through, usually in blocks of a thousand at a time, and usually they will prefix the number with a random sequence of prefixes until they get a combination that not only appears to work, but rings the phone that they, that they control. At that point, they have a viable target. If you analyse the numbers that they're calling, and all of this is in there, that open, open data on the URL I, I gave you, but it's hidden in the, the data that I gave you because it has all of these prefixes in. But if you do a little bit of maths on that and you strip off all of these prefixes and you look at where the numbers actually lie, um, i.e. what country codes those target PSTN numbers are, are in, then the geography of it all changes quite a bit. And I'm pleased to say you guys aren't there at all. Um, they principally are numbers in Jerusalem, and I'm ashamed to say, Birmingham um, in the UK. And I'm not the UK generally, Birmingham. <laughs> um, if you analyse it, which incidentally is where I'm from, which is why I'm ashamed to say, but um, if you analyse it further, you'll see that 25% of the traffic on the, on the honey car says from two numbers. We're going for two, two numbers. 50% of it was from the top 10. So there's not loads of these guys with loads of different, different endpoints. We've focused right in on, hopefully, the, the key perpetrators. And like I say, they're mostly ordinary landlines. They're not calling. Yeah, you still get the script kitty that will dial Lithuania and, and, and places, but the, the serious guys are calling innocuous, innocuous numbers. They're not in the commercial feeds. We subscribe to most of them because, you know, combating board is one of the USBs we offer our, our customers. They're not in there. And remind it, it's test traffic. The actual attack. From, from anybody's conventional definition hasn't started at this stage. There's been no loss at this stage. There may have been a DOS, sort of, or an apparent DOS, early on when they were doing, they were doing the scan stage. But at this stage, everything, everything is normal. In 24 hours' time, people may say, oh yeah, we've been compromised, and look at the traffic and see lots of calls to the usual places. They won't look at these. These are ordinary end-user as, as I say, 24 hours or so later, they'll go on and they'll send the, you know, the flood of calls to, to expensive destinations that we're probably all, all familiar with because we've all seen it. However, that is changing as well. Um, a few years ago, um, well, even a year ago, when an endpoint was, was compromised, they would send traffic through in quite a, um, I suppose frantic is the only way to describe it. You'd suddenly see 200 channels to Somalia. And there were some people built their fraud protection systems simply on, mon on monitoring channels because you would see an uncharacteristic spike for, for, for a customer. They're getting more clever, just like the DDoS guys are getting more clever. It's not all about flooding, it's not all about volume, it's not all about being, being frantic. It's about making money um, and it's about getting as many calls through over potentially a prolonged period as they can. So they're going at a lower level, a level that may slip under the radar. Equally, the customer that I mentioned that was compromised at, at Christmas, they'd done all their recon. They knew they were an ISP, so they had you know, their own IP addresses, so they knew exactly where all this equipment was. They knew it was all the same equipment. They knew they could compromise any of it at any time. But when we intervened, because we saw unusual traffic on the customer's account and an attack was shut down, they just went away. And they came back the next night. And then they came back the next night. And it was very, it was very, very different. Um, it's getting more professional, which is the, the, the scarier aspect of it. Yes, the script kiddies are still out there, but it's, it's getting more serious, it's getting more organised, um, and it's potentially getting a lot more expensive. So, what can you do about it? Well, the good news is, lots, and it doesn't cost anything. 
I get terrified when we speak to ITSPs who say, oh yeah, we send out bills at the end of the month. You tell me you send out bills or you bill at the end of the day and I will be in a panic. You want to be billing continuously because then you've got something to monitor. You want to be billing as close to real time as you conceivably can. Now yes, that's not perfect. They could compromise your system in a way that bypasses the billing and we've seen that with, with customers. But if you're looking at a compromised user account rather than a compromised provider system, then the more, the more you're billing and the more you're monitoring it, the better. Buy with prepayment. I'm speaking our own book here because we only offer prepayment. We only ever have. Um, it used to be a hard sell. It's not anymore. We get people coming to us saying, can you do us prepayment? And the answer is yes. <coughs> but the reason they want it is because they view that as their risk capital. They don't need to worry on the first of the month that they're going to get a 250 grand bill turn up from the provider that they didn't expect. Because they know the X thousand pound of prepay they've got, if it's gone, it's gone. Yeah, that's bad, but it's not going to cost them any more. But the major caveat there is there's wholesale providers out there that do prepayment that will still send you a bill. So you need to be doing so with a provider that can actually kill calls in progress when you've run out of credit. And to be fair, most do. You also want your CDRs from your provider real time, because as I mentioned, if it's, a, if it's the provider system that's compromised and billing is, billing is bypassed, then you're not going to have your own records to, to monitor and report against. So if your wholesale carrier can give you CDRs in real time, we do, um, then you can monitor those, and indeed a lot of customers tend to rely on ours rather than relying on them precisely because they are, they are real time. But if you're dealing with a wholesaler that's giving you, giving you them at the end of the month, or even the day after, yeah, you could be billing frequently yourself, but you've potentially got stuff slipping through the, through the net there. Use the data that's up there. Like I say, it's been there for three years. It's going to remain there. Um, use it. You'll find some interesting stuff in there. You may find some stuff that we haven't, and if you do, please you know, let us know. Um, but, but, but use it. You know, There's interesting stuff in there. You look, there's a file that uh, monitors events by uh, user agent. Now on 100% of them, a friendly scanner. Now again, that's changing, and it's changing at the stage of the attack. So what you find is the, the options request and the register of the scan events will, will come from friendly scanner or increasingly uh, SIP CLI. When they go on to the actual attack stage, they will tend to spoof something a bit more, um, you know, a bit more sensible. Um, but if you're using um, user agent filtering, then you can stop this right at the start. I'd, I'd remind you, it all starts with an options request. So if you don't respond positively to that reconnaissance options request, you're highly unlikely to go on to the next stage of the attack. So if you've got user agent filtering for the top bad user agents within your, your installations and you're not responding in any way, you're just, you're just dropping packets, you, you're defending yourself quite, quite well there. If you don't want to do blacklisting of user agents, do whitelisting of user agents, because you know which ones you've got out there on the, on the network. To echo a lady's comment, use TLS. It, it drives me mad that, out of the box, most VoIP uh, or SIP installations use UDP on 5060. It doesn't mean you have to. Um, TLS is there in pretty much every uh, you know, user agent and equipment on the market. Well, I learned today, David will sell you one that it isn't. Um, but if TLS isn't there, TCP is. With both of them, the TLS you obviously get the security thing. With TCP, uh, you get other benefits such as you know getting over fragmentation issues and things like that, which is obviously more of an issue with um, you know SDPs getting bigger. Um, but what what's relevant here is that these uh, these scans, these attacks, entirely take place. Correct that. Mostly take place on UDP or 5060. So if you're using TLS, aside from all of the good stuff that you get with TLS itself, you're dramatically reducing your attack footprint. It's not there on UDP or 5060, so there's nothing to attack. Avoid auto-provisioning for the reasons that I mentioned, but if you are going to implement it, don't just have it as the, the box or the VM in the corner that does whatever it does. Put in there some monitoring, you know, rate limit requests to it, and that filter user agents, none of which appears to be there in the, the installations that are out there in the world. They're just begging to be, to be had. 
And crucially, we think you need to monitor and control uh, what traffic you're passing off the net. Because what we've seen with compromised customers, where they've been compromised at the provider layer, is they lose access to their admin systems. They lose access to their reporting systems. Now that could either be load, because it's a relational database, off your network. One of the things we do in our API, as well as getting the CDRs in real time, and the reports on traffic in real time, you can see the value of calls in progress. Some customers implement that as a quick 20 minute script we, we did as a, as a demo for customers that they could, they could use in their, in their NOC. Because the, the channels to a particular destination are, are less relevant. The channels on a particular account are almost irrelevant. The value of calls in progress to a particular destination is really relevant. And if you're getting back a summary of the value of calls you've got to every country, you can build your own logic around that really easily. You know, I know we only spend more than, you know, no more than five pound on calls to France at any one time. You know, Virgo, send me an email if it's six pounds. Send me a text message if there's seven pounds to Somalia. You can do whatever you want, whatever suits your your business logic with this stuff. If you've got the if you've got the information, uh, we and increasingly a few others um, extend sort of the SIP protocol with custom headers. So customers, when they pass us an invite, can set a maximum cost for a call, so a maximum uh, charge per minute. Crucially, a maximum uh, connection charge, because a lot of these PRS calls um, have only a connection charge or a high connection charge and a low per minute per minute charge, which people often often miss. Um, we also offer our customers a, uh, an ACL so they can black and whitelist dark codes around the planet on both an account basis and a, an individual um, trunk basis. And we offer channel limits, but not just the basic channel limit for an account or for a trunk. We break that down further. So they have a channel limit for non-UK calls. They have a channel limit for any individual number dialed, dialed at one time and then they have a separate channel limit for what we define as known hotspots. So they're all the companies that I mentioned uh, before where we, we're actually seeing uh, traffic from, from compromised customers going. And I should mention these are in real time uh, nationwide around the, around the whole network. As well as the channel limits, for the same, the same granularity we offer, we offer rate limits which work quite well for some, you know, some customers. We've, we've got one customer that specialises in the oil business. So his customers typically do ring Nigeria, Somalia, all of the all of the places that uh, you know you might consider um, problems, and they might make quite a few calls in parallel to them, but they don't make a lot of calls. So they can set a rate limit: so many calls per 12 hours, so many calls per 10 minutes on, on each of this, uh, these these granular bases. One of the things we do is we send real-time alerts. Um, so we monitor. Um, a load of known numbers, thousands of known numbers that we get from commercial feeds and also the stuff that we get from our own honeypot. Now crucially this includes those test numbers that and we push out alerts to people by text message, by, by email, um, real time. And I mean literally real time, it's not an analysis of the database in retrospect, it's actually in the call flow, is there an issue here, cue, a, cue an alert which is sent by a daemon um, immediately. And finally, you want to be able to do stuff with your provider in, in real time, um, like turning a customer off, or kind of turning a customer trunk off, or even setting your, your, own, uh, you know, your own account settings and thresholds. Real time, remotely, off your own, off your own system. So just to put the plug in, um, there's no vapor wet there, that's all in our API, um, and has been for, for some time. Uh, when I speak to competitive um, operators that it won't scale. Um, well, no, it won't scale for your radius or your relational database-backed authentication system. Um, we're uh, event-driven. We, our business logic stack relies entirely on Redis, um, which is insanely quick. Um, and with our current volumes, it's doing 300,000 operations per second. I beg one of those operators that uh, says it doesn't scale to actually even be doing 300,000 operations per second on their, on their existing architecture. So just to sum it all up then, um, we think fraud is the number one risk to avoid businesses. It really destroys 
customer trust. And even if you do all of the good stuff to protect your customers, they don't appreciate it when they've been had. It kills relationships, as well as killing businesses. Um, we think you need to manage the risk, um, not the margin. Um, voice is changing. It's, it's becoming a feature on other services, not a service, billable service in its, in its own right. Um, but don't do it on your own. There's lots of stuff you can do for free. Um, but lean on your carrier. We know our competitors are copying a lot of this stuff. Um, that's good. You know, it helps everybody to, to stamp this problem out. But nag them for it. They don't do it already. Um, make them do it. That's me done. Um, I've got, that's the, that's the white paper. I've got, I don't know if I've got enough for everybody, but I've got a fair few. So come and grab one of those off me if you want one. Um, if you want an account to play about what we do, there's a URL there. But also on the, the, the main website, you can sign up for a PDF uh, copy of that as well if you, if you prefer.